We're going to be in John chapter 8. Just jump in there with me. Talking about the voice of God. Voice of God. If you're here today, I have to believe there's something in you that says, I want to hear the voice of God. Those of you who've believed and followed Jesus for many years, you're always asking that God would speak. And last week we looked at how important prayer is in that, that we posture our hearts and minds in prayer. We let it, our prayers be fed by Scripture. Today, I want to talk a little bit more about Scripture and how important that is. But first, I want to jump into something that Jesus is teaching. And it's critical that we start, before we talk about Scripture today, and before I say something like, yeah, go read your Bible some more, which is what you would expect me to say, right? You, you would expect me to say, go read your Bible more. There's something bigger that we're going to talk about today than just go read your Bible more. That's important, but we have to know what's in there and what God wants to speak to us. But Jesus, as the crowds started to grow, as more and more people in, in his community and the regions around him started to hear that he was healing people, that he... He preached with authority, and, and, and there was something about this rabbi. Some were saying he's the Messiah. Some were even saying he might be the Son of God. And what does that mean? I don't know, but let's go see. And many started to say that they believed. Many, many started to say, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he is the anointed one of God. And so Jesus speaks into this moment, a very strategic time, and, and he says something to those crowds who've crowded around, he says this, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. So, so Jesus is saying to the crowd, hey, I, I know a lot of you've come to see a show. I know a lot of you've come to witness a healing or something take place miraculous or for me to say something that might stir something in you. He says, I want you to know who really is my disciple. And he says, my real disciples are not just people who believe, but people who hold to my teachings. Write this down. True discipleship, more than a passive belief in Jesus, but an active practice of Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. The world and our nation does not need more people who say they believe in Jesus. They need more people who live and act and love like him. Can I get a witness? Yes, okay, all right. I got the front row, I'm coming for the back, y'all. Listen, we are here to do more than just say we believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead. We are here to actually say we can activate. Now. If you don't believe in Jesus and you're here or you're watching, I want you to know that you belong, that you belong to us. We love you and we care about you and you can be a part of what God is doing here. But I want to say this, the more you hang around, the more you will open your heart and mind to believe. But Jesus says it right here, that belief in him Passive belief in him doesn't make you a true disciple. What does it mean to practice Jesus? It means to progressively think, feel, and act like Jesus. In other words, we will start to have a mindset of Jesus. We will start to see people differently. We'll start to even see the stranger on the street differently. We won't see them as someone we need to avoid. We'll see them as someone we need to minister to. Uh, we won't see our enemies as someone we need to, to, to throw stones at or to, uh, to slander or to push away. But instead, we will see them as image bearers of God that we need to pray for and intercede on behalf. We'll start to feel differently. Our sentiments will change. We'll start to weep for the things that God weeps for. We'll start to see marginalized people and not, and not, not look at them and, and place our political umbrella around them and, 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 and say something, well, that's just that. Instead, we'll start to go, no, 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 that, that makes me sad. Or that activates some feeling of righteous anger in me. I don't want to see people sold into slavery. I don't want to see people mistreated. Where does that come from? It comes from the feeling 
of Jesus in us, he starts to take over even our emotions. And then as a result, we start to act like Jesus. We start to step into ministry. We start to step into this world with light and salt and love. And so we have to understand, if we're going to talk about the scriptures today, that just believing in Jesus and just believing in the Bible that, that it's true, or some of you would say mostly true, that's not what makes us a disciple, or according to Jesus, a true disciple. That these things would actually begin to renovate our heart, mind, soul, and ultimately even our very lives. Jesus never separates believing his words from practicing them. I want you to look to the person beside you and say, you got to go to practice, y'all. Tell them that. Go wake somebody up. Tell them it's time to get up. You got to go to practice. Look, everybody wants to get in the game. Coach, put me in the game. Well, you aren't at practice. You got to go to practice. We have to practice. And the more that we practice, the more that we believe in a transformational way. So that brings us to the question. Why are the scriptures critical to hear God's voice and practice Jesus for life? Why do we need to read the scriptures? Why do we need to study the scriptures? Why do we need to connect with scripture to hear God's voice and to practice Jesus? I want to look at that today. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, my wife's grandmother has been staying with us uh, this past week, um, and she has been just a delight to host. Uh, her name is Ernie. I don't know if Ernie, is Ernie in the house? Ernie in the house? Okay, she's not here. That's okay. That's okay. I'm going to tell you about Ernestine. Ernestine is 90 years old and could outrun all of us. Yes. And uh, I had her come in this past week to uh, our Waymaker Institute students and interns and residents and our staff and I did a little interview with her on Monday just to talk about going the distance in a life in Jesus and going the distance in, in a life in ministry in the church. And she was such a blessing to our team. You know, she, she sprung right out of her seat and came over to the stool. And, I, and you know, she's not, she's not with a cane or a walker. I mean, she's just, she's ready to go. And we talked through her, her story. And she's really lived four different lives. She lived a life of growing up, and then around 17 or 18, she married her husband, Clyde, and they had four children, and they were the pastors of, of, of several churches over their life, and then her husband, Clyde, went to heaven when they were in their early 50s, and she lived as a widow for the next decade and a half, about 26, 27 years. And she became a missionary, a missionary to Russia and Mongolia and parts of China. For, for 26 years, she lived a whole nother life as a single woman, as a widow. And then at 77, she met a man. Come on. 77, y'all. Who was 80, right? He was robbing the cradle. Yeah. And I had the privilege uh, 13, 14 years ago of actually officiating part of that ceremony. It was, it was such a delight to be, uh, be a part of that, to see you know, them start a new phase of both of their lives. They were both widows. And, and, and oh, they didn't stop at 77 and 80. They, 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 they went on and, and did a new level of ministry. Uh, Dr. Clifton Wood, her second husband, uh, was a counselor and a pastor really up until the day he went to heaven just a few weeks ago. And, and, and I'm telling you, they ministered to married couples and, and, and to people who needed breakthrough and people who needed pastoring. So I'm interviewing her and she's telling her story and she's just, of course, we're talking about some spiritual things and some things about, and then I just said, okay, look, this is the question people wanna ask. How, how, do you, how do you be 90 years old and you could, you know, do a triathlon like you? Like, like how, do you, how do you stay fit and healthy like you? 
And she says, I never take the elevator. There you go, guys. There, that's all you need right there. Just never take the elevator. She says, I'll always take the steps. She says, whenever it's possible, I will, I will walk up the steps. So all of you who are in CrossFit, just drop the kettlebells. <laughs> just drop, drop the, 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 the weights and, and just walk up the steps. Now, of course, there's more to that than just walking up the steps and not taking the elevator. But I think it's a principle that's so, so prevalent today in our culture, but especially when we talk about growing as a true believer, as a disciple of Jesus, and especially as we interact with Scripture, that oftentimes we find ourselves as American wanting to take the elevator in spiritual growth. We want to take the elevator when it comes to diving into the scriptures. We, we want it to be easy. We just want to push a button and then go up and then all of a sudden we're on the top floor and they okay, there we go. I, I didn't really have to, to do much. I just had to kind of ride the elevator. I, I, I want to challenge that today and talk about why we need to and why it's necessary that if we're going to activate the life of Jesus and our thoughts, our feelings, and ultimately our actions, and be more than just passive believers, but be active practices of Jesus, that God's word has to be more than often what we see it as. Sometimes we see the scriptures as just a textbook. It's just a textbook. It's just something that I can analyze and intellectually debate. And we spend a lot of time talking about Jesus and talking about God and analyzing our systematic theology and our theories on this. We spend more time talking about God and talking about who Jesus is than actually living and loving like him. Why? Because the scriptures to us is primarily just a textbook. God's voice and Jesus' teaching when it's a textbook, becomes an academic debate, an academic debate. And, and some of you have been caught up in that for seasons of your life, or you just left a season where it's just like, wow, how did I just spend so much time arguing about the Bible instead of let the Bible read me and transform me? Sometimes we look at the Bible as just a rule book. And, and I remember seasons of my life, especially growing up, seeing the Bible more as a rule book. It was a moral code book that, that had a religious connection to it. And it was something that I needed to strive. I needed to get to A to get to B to equal C. And then if I got to C, then I could get to D, and then that would equal E. And somewhere along the way, though, I got caught up in E. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to get to to the next thing. And so what happens when we make the scriptures a rule book and we're striving in faith is we either have to do one of two things. Uh, we either have to get stuck in our faith or we just have to be a hypocrite, right? We have to make exceptions and loopholes to why we can't get to that next place. Well, why we're the exception or we just have to be a hypocrite. We say one thing, but we do another. You guys with me? Is this just therapy for me or, 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 or am I connecting with something? That sometimes we make the scriptures just a rule book. And so what happens is God's voice and Jesus' teaching become a religious code to break. I want to say this, and this is, this is critical. If you don't get anything today, get, take the stairs and then get this. Faith does not grow by striving. It grows by surrendering. Come on, I got the middle section. I got the middle section. I'm going to come over here. To, faith is not about you striving. It's not about you going, shh, shh, shh. okay, yeah, yeah, I got I to gotta do that. And I got, okay, uh, let me take these earrings out. And uh, okay, oh, this tattoo, there's nothing I can do about that. But anyway, it's not about you striving. It's about you and me surrendering every day. God, take this pride and this fear and this laziness in me get it out. I surrender it. I surrender it another day. I will not strive in my own self-rule in my idolatry. I lay these things down before you. Take me to the next level. Take me up the steps. Mm. 
Mm, that was for somebody. Somebody at home just fell off their kitchen chair. Okay? I get it. Been there. Somebody helped them up. Sometimes, though, Scripture is just a devotional book. Man, whoo, Jesus is calling, y'all. Yeah, don't mess with my Jesus is calling. For, for some of us, that's like our horoscope, isn't it? Every day, okay, what, what is today? Uh, Jesus, he's my boyfriend. Yes. Or my homeboy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus becomes a devotional. The scripture has become a devotional to make us feel a certain thing. And if we're not feeling a certain thing, we, we try to search out another scripture and, and okay, I got to just know Leviticus. And then we get to the Psalms and, right? Yeah, some of you know, you grew up in the church, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who, <laughs> who are new to church, you're like, what, Leviticus? What happens though when we make Scripture, just a devotional. God's voice and Jesus' teaching get misinterpreted in unreliable feelings. This is big. I, I read this this week that scientists have actually determined that we only feel emotions for 90 seconds. And we decide what we're going to do in that 90 seconds. If we're going to build on that emotion or if we're going to let it burn itself out. And this, is so, this was so breakthrough for me because I have a teenager. Okay, nobody got that, right? So, you know, you, you, you start to, you're in a conversation maybe with your, your wife or your husband or with your teenager or your, your coworker at, at, at work and all of a sudden some, some emotion gets triggered. Here, here's what you need to do. You just set your watch. Just, hey, hang on one second. I'm going Siri, set a time for 90 seconds. And you just sit there. Honey, I'll be right with you. I know this is important to you, babe but I need 90 seconds. Oh, you know what, son? I'm just gonna walk around the house seven times. Stay right here. I'm gonna walk around it seven times. No, 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 don't leave the house seven times. And then we come back and we're like, okay, there were some walls that had to fall in me. Why? Because we get in our feelings. We get, is this just me, y'all? Okay, okay, because I, 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 I feel like sometimes that that I might just be the only one here that gets a little mad or a little sad and doesn't let the 90 seconds burn it up. And then I build on it. And then all of a sudden I am all up in my flesh and I'm making declarations and I'm pulling stuff back from 20 years ago. I go into my file. Well, honey, you know what you did back in 1997. There you go. Oh, man because I get in my feelings. You know, we can make a scripture and a devotional book. And what happens is it, it stirs up some feelings in us and, and those feelings are a part of the toolbox that God gives us in our soul, but they're not the only tool. And we need to surrender and submit those feelings to the Holy Spirit. So what happens is we separate in each of these defaults we separate the scriptures to just the mind or the intellect, or we separate it just to the will. I just need to get myself together. Scriptures help me. Or we submit it to the heart. I need to feel something. And we don't realize that we're actually all of those things. And so by the time we get to Hebrews, and the writer of Hebrews is, is talking to a very specific audience, and he takes this moment in Hebrews chapter four to remind them what scripture is. Now, here's what you have to know. The writer of Hebrews, uh, so there was a lot of debate if it was Paul and that kind of got put to rest uh, in, the, in, the, in the Protestant Reformation. And then people started saying, well, well, maybe it's Barnabas or maybe it's Apollos. We don't know. We just know it was somebody who hung out with Paul because a lot of the themes in Paul's writings are also in this, but Paul always introduced himself in a letter, and this would have been uncustomary, so they just stylistically said, somebody was hanging out with Paul and heard from the Holy Spirit and wrote this to Jewish believers who had believed that Jesus is the son of the living God and began to follow him, but what happened is these 
Judaizers, people who wanted to make Christianity or wanted to make the way of Jesus just some warmed up Judaism started creeping back into the church and saying, no, 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 no. All of this is, needs to be put back into its place and, and, and we need to be following the law. And so the writer of Hebrews, Barnabas or Apollos or whoever, started to write from his own growing up as a young Jewish boy and into a man to men and women who had grown up Jewish, who had read the prophets and the patriarchs and the poets of the Old Testament. And what he does is he says, the scriptures that all of us grew up on, right before the Sabbath meal, our fathers would stand up and quote Proverbs 31, and then we would all eat, and then we would go to the synagogue, and we would hear the, 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 the rabbis read the scriptures, and all of that, Jesus was there the whole time. I want you to look to the person beside you and say, Jesus was there the whole time. Tell them that. He was in Leviticus. Tell them that. He was in Leviticus. He was in Deuteronomy. He was in Psalm. He was in all of it. And that's what the writer of Hebrew is trying to let these people. Jesus came not to abolish the law, but he came to complete it. And in his death and resurrection, he has completed it. So we do not need to put on the yoke of our ancestors, this writer is saying. Instead, we have to know something about Scripture. Also, understand this. The writer of Hebrews didn't know that he was writing the New Testament. He thought he was just typing up an email. Thank you. I appreciate that. Courtesy laugh. Well, dad joke there. They didn't have email back then. Silly goose. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, he just thought he was writing a letter. And, and remember, they were still writing the Gospels. They, they were still collecting the, 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 the Gospels and, and writing them. And the Apostle Paul, he was writing letters too. And, and John hadn't yet written his his apocryphal revelation. So what we see here is Scripture being written about Scripture that becomes Scripture. Say that three times really fast. And so what he is saying is, hey, you need to know this about what Jesus has done and what he always was doing in Scripture. Make sense? Let's jump in. Hebrews 4 verse 12. The Word of God. He's pulling in, pulling it in, is alive and active. This ain't no regular book. It's not dead. It's not written by dead energy or a dead spirit. It's written by the Spirit of the living God to surrendered authors speaking presently and into the future. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, hey, you have to know something here. You have the Spirit of God in you differently, differently than even our ancestors. And so when you read the Scriptures, Jesus is in there. Jesus was there when David slew Goliath. Jesus was there when Moses parted the Red Sea. Jesus was there, yeah, when Daniel was in the lion's den. Come on, I can, I can start preaching that one, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resist. Write this down. Scripture is a catalyst to connect our mind to Jesus. What Scripture is doing is it's not ignoring our intellect, it's connecting our intellect. I won't say that again, because some of you but you are really smart people. And you, and you get up in your mind and you get up in your thoughts and you get up in your, your analytics sometimes and you forget Jesus. And what scripture is doing is it's connecting you in your intellect and in my intellect to Jesus. Hey, he was there. And let me say this, he is active, he is alive, he is catalyzing you and God's word and God's voice are speaking to you 
right here and right now. I want you to bow your heads right now. Just bow your heads right now. If you're at home or you're in your car, don't bow your head if you're in your car. But if you're in the room, I want you to bow your head. And, I, and I'm, we're just gonna, I'm just going to quote Scripture right now. And I want, you, I want you to see what it does to your mind. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let that activate your mind right now. You say, Holy Spirit, would you, would you activate my mind with that word? He created. God is a creator. He created every thought. All of the chemistry and the biology of your human brain to think on a spiritual level. And he started with, let there be light. Wow. All right. Come back here with me. You see what happens? I mean, I, that was just one phrase in a paragraph of the first paragraph of the first page. Somebody said, well, it didn't do anything for me. Keep going. Let the Spirit of God take you deeper into that. Next, the Scriptures are sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. Woo! It cuts you mm. and me in, in a surgical way, right? And, and you think about a sword as a weapon, but it's also, it's also a, a tool to heal. It's also a tool to heal. And, and what the writer here is saying is because Jesus lived and he died and he was always there and he, rose, he resurrected from the dead and that spirit is in you, the scriptures now become this guardian in your life, almost like a, an armed guard who's walking along with you in your will. Write this down. The scripture is a guardian that leads our will to surrender to Jesus. Every day that you and I wake up, we wake up in a war zone for our heart, our mind, and our spirit. We already talked about that today. And, and here's what the scripture does. It becomes this guardian to make sure that the will that we have to want to wander to run, to reject, to rule ourselves, right? To pick up old idols again. The scriptures is that guardian to say, no, 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 put that down. Put that down. That is not for you. Hey, 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 right over here. Here's Jesus. Jesus, don't forget. Jesus is right here. He's right here. He's right here. And you know what? He wants to activate the word in you and he wants it to reshape your thoughts and the way you feel about things and ultimately the way you act. Scripture is not only a guardian, but it's something else. Look what it says, verse, sec, or third part of that. It says, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Remember, our heart, the emotional seat, symbolically, of our soul that which we feel with, that which really is that, that thing that we sense things and we discern things in, what the scriptures become is it becomes this authority in our life. And man, don't we need authority right now? I, I mean, we, we turn on the TV every day and, and there's a new level of mistrust in authority, all kinds of authority. And, and, and people are clamoring to say, what is an authority that I can trust? What is an authority that, that I don't have an eyebrow raised or uh, ready to, you fill in the blank. Many of you had authorities growing up that, you, that, that created a mistrust in authority. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, is hey, hey, this is a, an authority. This is a catalyst. This is a guardian. And this is an authority in your life. And here's the deal, when you can't trust your feelings because they're not always in the right place and they're not always leading you in the right direction, the scriptures is an authority that reveals the human heart so Jesus can heal what's hidden there. What's hidden there. 
There's stuff hiding in my heart, even right here and right now, that I don't even know about, that later on this afternoon, the, the, the scriptures was gonna say, hey, that thing right there, it's gonna become toxic if you don't confess it. That thought you just had, it's gonna lead you, not in a behavior this evening, but it's gonna keep taking root and it's gonna lead you into a temptation three days from now. Oh, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how the human, it's not, it's not the thing you see five minutes from now that leads you to drink the whole bottle. It's the thing three days from now because that thing took root in your heart and you thought, I don't know if I can trust God to really help medicate me in this. I don't know if I can trust God to soothe me. Let me pick up that old idol again and go into this place. You see, the scripture, when we see it more than a textbook or a rule book or just a devotional book, and we start seeing it as a catalyst and a guardian and an authority that is uncovering hidden things in us, what begins to happen? And Jesus promises us this. Look what he says in John 8. If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Well, how do I know what your teachings are? I go to the scriptures. You see, I go to, you see, Jesus had to know that Matthew was hanging around. Matthew, take some notes, right? John, John, get, get, get something to write with and, and, and get this down. He had to know that these men were going to document his life and his teachings so that you and I, his church, 2,021 years later, would have the catalyst and the guardian and the authority for our senses. See, I open up the scriptures and there my senses interact with it. And then what happens? The Spirit of God activates my mind and my will and my heart to take those scriptures and be transformed by them. It's not a textbook. It's not a rule book. It's not just a devotional. It is the truth. Then you will know, Jesus says, the truth. What truth? He's not talking about mental intellectual knowledge. He's not talking about, you got a new factoid. Go argue it with your friends. You you, you got a new theory. Go put it on Facebook before you even know what you're talking about. No one's ever done that here, of course. No, the truth that he's talking about is literally trust. He says, you will know the truth. You You will know in your thinking, in your will, your ability to choose or not choose, and in your heart, your emotional seat, you will know that you can trust God. See, you'll know that truth. And when you know that you can trust God, you can step out of fear, you can kneel to push away pride. And you can stand up and rebuke laziness. And you can walk and practice Jesus for life. You can know that yes, that if you go the extra mile, the second mile in the name of Jesus, that there is a divine gift at the mile post of mile number two. You can know that when someone strikes you on one cheek, you can trust that God has for you on the other end of that other cheek that is struck, that God has for you an assignment, an appointment, a revelation, a power that will shake the world. You can trust that, Jesus says. 
You can trust that. If you're, if you're going to be my true disciple, you're going to have to get this up in your heart. You're going to have to let this catalyze your mind. You're going to have to let this guard your will to the narrow path. But I'm going to tell you something, true disciples, that truth, that truth will set you free. Come on, y'all. It'll set you free from sin and the power of sin and the darkness of sin that wants to stick itself back to us. We can say that truth that I trust that God is who he says he is and that Jesus is the son of the living, that he died on a cross for my sin. That sin no longer sticks to me. It no longer condemns me. The truth that sets me free from evil the evil that every day I walk up, I wake up and walk out into a, a, a world that is broken by sin and broken by strongholds of evil. Jesus says, look, you'll know the truth and that truth will set you free from the intimidation of the gates of hell. In fact, you know what you'll do? You'll push those gates back because you have the truth that sets you free in you. The freedom that looks at death in the face and says to live is Christ, to die is gain. Death, you no longer have a sting. You no longer have a grip on my life. I will walk boldly. Whether I live to be 29 or 90, I will walk up the stairs. Come on. In Jesus name, I will walk up the steps. That is the power of the scriptures. Now I could have gotten up here today and I could have, I could have read you a, a, a few passages to talk about why you should read your Bible more and every single one of us would have walked out and said I probably just need to read my Bible more and you probably would have read your Bible but let me tell you something you need to know this is not a textbook you need to know this is not a rule book you need to know this is not just a devotional this is the living active voice of God catalyzing you to new life guarding you from the valley of the shadow of death and your will that wants to take you there. And I'm going to tell you, there is the authority that will uncover things that need to be uncovered and brought to life so you can give them right back to Jesus and say, I don't want this. I want what you've got next. And I want to walk in freedom. Can I get a witness, Waymaker Church? You better get up off the couch. You got to stand up on the kitchen table. Come on, stand up with me. Stand up with me. Woo. If you're in the room, I just want you to bow your heads. If you're, if you're on the treadmill, just get off the treadmill right now. If you're walking in the neighborhood, just let this, let this become instruction for you. If you're in the room, though, bow your head. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do it today, and I want you to do it the rest of your life. I want you to let Scripture catalyze your mind. Let scripture catalyze your mind. Right now, I'm going to quote some scripture. And they're going to seem random, but they're going to catalyze your mind because the Holy Spirit is going to use the Word of God to catalyze you, to guard you, and to be an authority to reveal things to you. Jesus wept. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life in the beginning was the word the word and the word became flesh go and make disciples of all nations teach them baptize them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and i will be with you to the end of the age let that bring life to you right now you are not an orphan you are not a reject you are a child of god and his word is in you right now let the scriptures guard you right now let the scriptures guard your will right now. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path.
Let it guard you right now. Let it guard you. God is going to start bringing scripture to your mind. Scripture you learned when you were five years old in Sunday school. Let it bring you back. Let it bring you back. Let it bring you back. You've been running in some area of your life. You've been resisting. Now let the scriptures counsel your heart. Let it be an authority. Let it reveal things that are hidden there. Let it reveal things. Just bring those words right to the to, to the to the top of your mind right now. God is connecting these things. He's connecting these things to His Word. And, and, and practice this the rest of your days as you open up the words of God. He put them on page for your senses, but He catalyzes them with His Holy Spirit so that you and I can walk and talk and live and practice Jesus for life. I want us to sing right now. I want us to worship. But this is also a time of response. And if you're in the room, our response stations are open. If you want to take communion today, if you want to remember the body and the blood of Christ, if you're at home, go to your pantry, grab some elements, take communion today. Make, make that coffee table in your living room an altar. Down here, some of you have already come this morning to ask the Holy Spirit to do something new in your life. And this is also a place of confession. It's also a place where you can just be prayed over because God's doing a new assignment in your life. I want to welcome you as we sing and we worship to do that. Be obedient to whatever God is asking you to do. But we're going to sing a song that was written right out of this house. And you're going to be learning it while you're singing at the same time. But Taylor, who was the primary writer of this song, he has a very powerful story about where this song came from in his heart and imagination. It came out of circumstances, but it also came right out of the scriptures. And so he's going to teach us this song, but he's going to tell you really the story of the song. And I have to believe that the story behind this song is going to call some of you forward or call some of you to your knees. So whether you're watching online or you're here in the room, let this song minister to you and then let it become an anthem for you. 